Welcome to the Pacific Research Institute's Next Round Podcast. I'm Romina Ichan, CEO, and with me as always is Tim Anayev, Vice President of Marketing and Communications. So Tim, today is the first day in some time, I think in the last three weeks, that the sun is shining on Pasadena. Gosh, we've had more rain than I've seen in, in years in California and Los Angeles. Here in the in the Southland, we have to import about 60% of the water. So all of this water running into the Pacific Ocean is is frankly heartbreaking. Yes, you know, it's the same here in Sacramento. You know, what is this strange thing in the sky? It's sunshine. You know, it's one of the rare days where I didn't have to wonder, do I need to get out a rowboat to come uh, to come to work? But you're exactly right. Sacramento, of course, like every other, you know, even more so than in Southern California, our annual rainfall for the year is way over 100% of normal for the time of year. Our reservoirs in Northern California are certainly filling up, but they're not filling up up like they should be because uh, and we're going to make a plug. If you haven't read it, go get the great book, Winning the Water Wars by our Stephen Greenhut. It kind of goes through our policy battle over water over the past really 25 years or longer. And one of the things that we haven't done is we haven't built the additional above ground water storage that we need to capture this additional rainfall. And you see it. Um, the statistic that I saw is that we were getting enough rainfall in a day kind of flowing through our system that it could fill up Folsom Dam in three days. Yet most of that water is going out to the Pacific Ocean, not being pumped down to our farmers in Central and Southern California because of all these goofy rules on the Delta smelt. And it really kind of reinforces this debate that has been on the back burner for a while in the drought, but now shows how important it is. We have from the water bond in 2014 that, you know, our leadership team that I worked on with Connie Conway when she was Republican leader, we negotiated $2.7 billion for above ground storage, which actually was for two shovel ready projects, Sites Reservoir and Temperance Flat. That was the money they needed to build it. We appropriated in the bond, the people passed the bond. We're still waiting. It's 2023. We haven't turned a shovel yet. And it, it just is that we, we get caught up in these other kind of ancillary debates and others who, you know, use CEQA and other other procedures to throw roadblocks to these critical uh, projects for um, our, our, our our livelihood. You know, we need water to, to, to drink, to survive, to grow our crops, et cetera. And so you always say, what's it going to take to change people's minds? And if this doesn't change people's minds, I don't know what will. Well, you know, Tim, on, on a smaller scale here in LA, voters in 2018 approved a Measure W, which aimed at uh, improving LA a stormwater capture system. But of course, there's been very little progress. Officials say, well, you know, we did a little bit of work, but the LA Times actually reports that five to 10 billion gallons poured into the LA basin from the current storms, but only about 20% of it had been captured in the county. So county officials say that it'll take about three to five decades to really get it up to speed so that our system will be able to be at full capacity to, to capture enough water to comfortably provide water for, for Southern Californians. So, you know, it's it's kind of a sad state. And as you mentioned, it's, a, you know, there's CEQA is involved. There are the environmental groups that have been thwarted the state stability, even though those, <laughs> many have good intentions, that uh, is really stopping our ability to, to capture this water and, and we'll be suffering for it for a long time. And, you know, groundwater in kind of urban areas in, in central and southern California is important. That's why we need to improve our system so we can capture more of that water. And certainly, you know, as Steve Greenhut talks about in Winning the Water Wars, you know, we need an all of the above approach. We need to do all of these things. You know, we need to start thinking about water policy in California from the principle of abundance which we can do and can easily get there. And as this storm shows or storm show, we have a lot of rain coming down at times, um, rather than the principle of scarcity that we um, view everything through the prism of, of today. And I think this is a nice segue to, um, you can hear 
our Steve Greenhut and many other great California thinkers talk about issues like drought and water and how we can improve the quality of life in our major Southern California cities and our um, big cities uh, across California and across the West. At our annual um, PRI Sacramento Conference, our California Ideas in Action Conference, which is going to be on February 15th in Sacramento uh, at the Sutter Club, go to pacificresearch.org slash events to um, RSVP. Thanks to the generosity of our donors. It's uh, no charge to uh, join us for the day. And we're going to have a really good lineup of speakers talking about this and a host of other issues to improve the quality of life in our uh, urban centers in California. Our keynote speaker is Keith Knopf, the president and CEO of Rayleigh's. And we'll also have Michael Schellenberger, who is the author of San Francisco, well-known journalist who will be giving the closing comments. So it'll be a very good day, very interesting um, talk. If you're interested in any of these issues, I hope to see you on February 15th in, in Sacramento. And Ro, I know we have another interesting event in Southern California coming up soon. That's right. Uh, Gordon Chang, who is a leading expert on China, one of the country's uh, foremost experts on China, is flying all the way here from um, back east to give a talk in, in Newport Beach at the Pacific Club. That's on January 31st. And uh, all of the details to sign up is on our website at pacificresearch.org. So this week, we have a very interesting and who knew hot, hot guest in our Lance Azumi, who's the author of the new PRI book just published called The Great Parent Revolt, which you can get at Amazon and all your favorite online booksellers. And The Great Parent Revolt um, is co-authored by Wen Yuan Wu of the Californians for Equal Rights Foundation and our own Mackenzie Richards. And they profile parents who are facing a uh, firsthand this kind of movement for woke ideology and classroom indoctrination um, firsthand with their kids or in their community schools. And it really profiles what each of them did to uh, stand up to this um, huge indoctrination push and shares a lot of lessons that other parents across California and across the country who are facing these battles, um, what they can do, uh, take from them and, and, and do in their own um, in their own situations. This is a hot book. Lance has been doing all sorts of big national National interviews. He was on Fox and Friends today uh, promoting his book, and it's risen to number five for education policy and reform books on Amazon. So um, we couldn't have a bigger get this week, I think, Ro. That's right. And, you know, Tim, what I love about this book is that, well, you know, it's unlike other books on critical race theory, which is actually they're more academic. And Lance decided to write this book for the parents, the, the people who are on the front line and to try to inspire them with what others have done in other school districts, other parts of the country. So it's very readable. And I think I think a lot of parents would enjoy reading it. So here's Lance Azumi. Welcome to PRI's Next Round Podcast, Lance. Well, I'm glad to be here, Ro, with you and with Tim. So we're so happy to have you to talk about your new book, The Great Parent Revolt, which is, as a description on the back shows, that it explores probably the most controversial curriculum to, to confront America's classrooms. It's critical race theory. So for our listeners who may not have heard of the term or aren't, aren't sure of it, what it really is, uh, give us a short refresher on, on what you're talking about in the book and, and discuss critical race theory. Well, thanks, Ro. Uh, no, I think this book is uh, couldn't be more uh, topical, more timely, uh, because critical race theory, as you alluded to, is probably the most divisive uh, doctrine ever to enter America's schools. And basically, critical race theory is a Marxist theory based upon race. I mean, for most people who uh, remember their Marxist theory, you know, you have uh, an oppressor class and you have an oppressed class. But under classical Marxism, uh, those classes were based upon economic status. So if you were wealthy, you were in the oppressor class. And if you were poor or working class, you were in the oppressed class. Uh, but what uh, critical race theory does is that it changes those classifications. You still have an oppressor class and an oppressed class, but instead of uh, it being determined by a uh, person's wealth, it, it's based upon your racial identity. And so therefore, if you happen to be white, uh, then you are in the oppressor class. If you are non-white, you're in the oppressed class. And the reason why uh, this is so insidious 
is that because of uh, this classification, then you can see why uh, you have then uh, terms such as systemic racism, institutional racism, white privilege, these all stem from critical race theory. So for example, if you believe in critical race theory and believe that whites are part of the privileged oppressor class and they founded the country and uh, created the founding documents uh, and the institutions in the United States, well, therefore, those institutions, those documents are all tainted by uh, white supremacy, white privilege, and therefore are in, uh, institutionally and systemically racist. And that's um, you know uh, what students in the classroom are facing when uh, you have teachers and administrators who are pushing this doctrine, and it's caused incredible division amongst people, uh, not a, just uh, across the United States, but certainly in the classroom uh, with children uh, fighting against other children and um, you know, teachers you know, ending up being propagandists, not educators. So Lance, a, a common criticism that you hear when you um, see the left and, and some media pundits talk about conservative efforts to stop critical race theory in our school is that it doesn't exist. But as you document in The Great Parent Revolt, it certainly seems like many parents across the country are confronting this controversial doctrine in their children's school. So just how prevalent is critical race theory in our school today? Is there any kind of quantification of it? And what's behind the left? trying to say that it doesn't exist when clearly it is a big problem. Well, it certainly is a huge problem, Tim. And, uh, you know, but the left is also very cagey, right? They know that uh, the term critical race theory and its open, uh, you know, connection with Marxist theories, you know, is not going to pass muster uh, for most American families. You know, they're not going to accept it if uh, they uh, hear that critical race theory is being pushed in their kids' classroom. So therefore, what the left has done is they're high, they're, they're pushing critical race theory and the tenets of critical race theory, but under different guises, under different uh, euphemisms. So you have, for example, terms such as diversity, equity, and inclusion, DEI, being used kind of as a euphemistic fig leaf for critical race theory. And, you know, that's, you know, very problematic because, you know, at at the average person say, well, you know, I'm in favor of diversity, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, equity seems like a good, uh, good thing and inclusion, I want to include people, I don't want to exclude people. So, uh, therefore, most people will say that that's a, uh, that that concept is a good thing, not really going down below uh, the uh, acronym, the DEI, to really see exactly how that Uh, term is being used uh, to push critical race theory tenants in the classroom. So, for example, the word equity, which is used all across education now, and you see uh, equity, uh, you know, being used versus equality. Equality means that everybody has the same opportunity uh, to achieve, uh, whereas equity means that you basically guarantee the same outcome for all people, which are two very different concepts. It's uh, uh, equated to, for example, uh, for equality, you all have the same opportunity to choose the shoes you like versus equity, where all students get the same shoes. And so, you know, uh, but again, uh, it's that type of euphemistic terminology that critical race theory now hides behind, and which also makes it very difficult to quantify the number of uh, schools, school districts, that are using critical race theory because they don't admit to it, because they know that it's a a toxic term that will turn off parents, uh, you know, in a shot. And so therefore uh, you have, uh, you know, so much of this almost like a kabuki dance going on uh, with critical race theory and how it's being used in the classroom and where it's being used. So Lance, you know what makes this book very unique is that you profile real people fighting CRT in the trenches. And the the first mom that you profile is Gabs Clark, who you describe as as poor African-American and courageous. So share a little bit about her story with us, uh, which ended up with her filing a, a federal lawsuit over how her biracial son was subjected to critical race theory in his school and even saw his high school graduation threatened. Yes, no, that's right, Ro. I, I mean, I really think that Gabs Clark is a 
a real hero. And she's really one of the most unlikeliest of heroes. Uh, you know, as you mentioned, she's an African-American woman. Uh, she's very low income. Uh, she has five kids. She's a single mom. And, uh, you know, she was so poor, in fact, that uh, she and her family, uh, her kids were living in a motel in uh, Las Vegas. And they would often have to make decisions about whether they were uh, going to use what little money they had to buy gasoline or buy food. Uh, Gabs had a disability that caused her financial situation to, uh, you know, really dwindle. And so therefore, you know, she was in a very difficult uh, situation personally. But, you know, so she in, had enrolled uh, her uh, children uh, in uh, a charter school in Las Vegas called Democracy Prep. And um, in this school, her, her oldest son, uh, William, uh, was in high school and uh, he was uh, taking a class called the Sociology of Change which it turns out was very heavily influenced by critical race theory principles. And one of the uh, exercises that uh, was required to do was to uh, do a racial uh, identity uh, uh, exercise that way he basically had to you know, list out uh, various characteristics that apply to himself, not just race, but also uh, religion and uh, sexual identity, all these sorts of pretty personal uh, uh, things and uh, then put that out and, and identify himself based upon those characteristics as whether he was privileged or not privileged, whether he was an oppressor class or an oppressed class. And uh, so William, you know, was very uncomfortable with that and he refused to do it. He refused to complete that assignment. Now that course, however, the sociology of change was a required course for graduation uh, because he did not complete this assignment, he was given a failing grade in that course. And, uh, you know, he was not given the option to opt out. He, he was, he failed that course. And because he failed a required course at the school, uh, he was not allowed to graduate. Well, you know, put uh, in this situation where uh, she, she sees her son, you know, losing his future, you know, all his plans for college and work are all being uh, now pulled out from under him being destroyed in front of her face, Gabs says she had to do something. Yes, she was poor. Yes, she had few resources, but she was able to find uh, attorneys uh, who would take her case. And she filed a federal lawsuit saying that the school had uh, violated William's First Amendment rights uh, to free speech, that the school had violated his 14th Amendment rights to uh, uh, equal protection under the law, that the school also violated his uh, rights under the uh, 1964 U.S. Civil Rights Act, which uh, bars any kind of discrimination based upon race, that all of these violations occurred because of uh, these mandates from the school uh, to William in the CRT-based class. Uh, so she uh, filed this lawsuit in um, uh, federal court. Uh, the judge interestingly enough, indicated that Gabs would actually likely win on the merits because uh, of uh, the heavy uh, consequences that befell um, William because of these mandates from the school. The school, because of this indication from the judge, then caved and offered to uh, give William uh, his diploma. But Gabs said, you know something, you've ruined a lot of my child's future because of uh, you've derailed his college and work uh, future and uh, the schools he wanted to get into, et cetera. So she continues to fight this lawsuit, uh, even though the, the school at first imploded uh, or caved in. And so I think that what this shows is, you know, the great heroism, not of, of Gavs, but also the fact that an ordinary person like her can do extraordinary things you know, and stand up. And that's what Gabs has said, that she tells parents that if parents don't stand up for their own rights, they're going to have those rights trampled on. And there's nobody else who are going to come to their rescue. And that's why she felt that she needed to stand up for her rights, but also the rights of all other parents who are having uh, their rights trampled upon. And I think that, uh, you know, she's a great role model for all parents across this country, all victims of critical race theory, and really for all Americans.
I think perhaps the most compelling chapter reading your book involves the story of a student named Joshua, whose name, you know, we've changed to protect him from from being canceled. He shares some very chilling stories of being a real victim of bullying and classroom indoctrination and, you know, really going through some very uncomfortable situations in his school. Can you share a little of his story with our listeners? No, absolutely, Tim. Yes, you're very right. I would certainly say that uh, his story is one of the most compelling stories uh, in our book, uh, The Great Parent Revolt. And he gives a real I mean, uh, unbelievable in the classroom view of what is going on under critical race theory. Um, you know, we often, you know, hear uh, reports by people who write about uh, what's going on. Whereas in the case of Joshua, he's giving us uh, in this book an almost reporter's view, a front seat reporter's view of what is going on under critical race theory. And so he says that there are uh, one of the exercises that he was required to do in a class in uh, middle school was a, something called a privilege walk, where all the kids were lined up uh, in the classroom and the teacher would call out certain characteristics that were uh, viewed as privilege. And so, for example, if you were white, you'd have to take a step forward. If you were male, you had to take a step forward. If you were Christian, you had to take a step forward. And so, but Joshua, uh, said that it felt like a criminal lineup to him where, you know, he had to then take steps forward and be, um, you know, singled out for his privileges in front of the whole class. And he felt extremely uncomfortable about that. And, you know, why should he uh, be the focus of, you know, uh, bad feelings in the classroom? Because he simply was born with these characteristics. And, you know, the, the, and, but that wasn't the only type of exercise that he had to do. He had to do something called an identity wheel. And he said that in this uh, identity wheel exercise, you know, there were like 16 or 17 different characteristics that uh, kids had to uh, grapple with, uh, their race, their religion, their sexual orientation, their gender, etc. And then they had to uh, list like where did they fall under these various categories. And then they had to then uh, sit with uh, other groups of students and tell, uh, you know, where they fell in these categories. And Joshua said, no, I shouldn't have been required to answer these personal questions on my identity, uh, including my socioeconomic status of my family or my sexual orientation. He said that these personal details shouldn't be the concern of other students in my class, and they aren't entitled to that information. You know, if I say I'm straight, then I get humiliated even more. Or if I say I'm upper middle class, then that's going to be worse for me. So again, you know, it's being singled out for characteristics that he has no control over and that he is then becomes uh, the, the focus of bad feelings amongst his classmates. Um, there was another uh, exercise that he had to do called uh, that where he would have to draw the face of a person without looking at the paper. And, you know, when he uh, did that, he came away with the, his own personal lesson that, well, you don't have to be perfect to do art. But when he mentioned that to his teacher, his teacher came back and said, well, perfectionism is white supremacy. And that perfectionism, paternalism, either or thinking and objectivity are part of white supremacy culture. And, you know, uh, he was shocked about that. And that uh, that viewpoint was part of their curriculum. And so it just goes to show you the amount of uh, ideological penetration that has gone on in these classes that were even a simple art exercise becomes political. Um, they also had to do things like a race and equity circles where the class would be divided up and uh, they would have to sit in circles and discuss uh, issues involving race and identity. And the under, unstated implication was that you know, one race may be bad and or less good than others. And the, what he also said, though, is that these types of um, political indoctrination exercises took time away from his real academic learning. And, uh, you know, which he said was really impacted by, you know, the amount of time that was uh, given to these um, CRT related exercises and also uh, the uh, view of uh, the uh, teachers that uh, students weren't 
uh, required to engage in as rigorous a, 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 an amount of coursework where they have to turn in homework on time or they have to take uh, tests uh, you know, uh, on, once only uh, instead of multiple times. And you know, uh, that was because the teachers were more concerned about equity and that, so that students could therefore turn in papers late, they could take tests multiple times, uh, they could uh, not do final projects which had previously been required. So I think that what uh, the bottom line is that Joshua felt that his academic experience had really uh, been degraded because of critical race theory. He came to school in order to learn his academics and what he got instead was political indoctrination. On the one hand, it's not just the indoctrination itself that is harmful, the propaganda that changes the uh, or forces students to change their views, but it's also to the lost time uh, that they uh, are forced to endure in terms of their academics. A very powerful chapter ripped right from today's headlines profiles Azra Nomani, who is a, a former reporter and a Muslim woman whose father actually marched with Gandhi and who protested the treatment of Asian students at her son's school in, in Fairfax County, Virginia. So tell us about her story and also why she's back in the headlines again, challenging woke indoctrination in, in her neighborhood schools. Well, thanks, Ro. Uh, Azra Nomani is a really amazing figure. Uh, she was born in India. Her father is an educator. She's Muslim. Her father marched with Gandhi uh, in protests against British colonialism. And so uh, when she came here to the United States, uh, she set, eventually settled in Virginia, uh, was a single mom, and uh, you know it had her son enrolled in Thomas Jefferson High School in uh, Virginia, which is uh, Virginia's top academic high school. And uh, you know she had been a reporter for the uh, Wall Street Journal, but uh, you know she had not covered education issues. You know she was just interested in uh, getting a good education for her child. And in order to get into uh, Thomas Jefferson High School, uh, her son, like all the other kids at that time who were applying to Thomas Jefferson, had to take a, a meritocratic um, based test. Uh, they also were judged upon uh, their grade point average and other objective measures of their academic achievement. But uh, when uh, her son was at uh, Thomas Jefferson, the school decided to change their admissions process. And the, the, what was really insidious about the change in the admissions process was that the change was directed at Asian Americans like Azra Nomani and others uh, who were at the school. Uh, Thomas Jefferson High School uh, right now, uh, at that time, had about 70% of its student body as Asian Americans. Well, uh, the left who controlled the school board uh, didn't think that that was the proportion that they liked uh, at Thomas Jefferson. They wanted to reduce the number of Asians. And so therefore uh, they changed the uh, admissions process to become much more subjective. And so instead of you know, relying just basically on test scores, uh, GPA and teacher recommendations, now you had other subjective factors uh, uh, being thrown in. Plus the fact that uh, they, the school board limited the number of students who could come from any particular middle school. Well, it turns out that most of the Asian Americans came from three uh, particular middle schools in the area. And therefore, if you cap the number of kids who could come from any of those uh, middle schools, you basically cap the number of Asians. And so uh, the, after the implementation of this new subjective uh, admission system, the pr proportion of um, Asian Americans fell by nearly 20%. And so, you know, because of this, uh, there was a huge grassroots uproar from the Thomas Jefferson uh, High School community. And Azra Nomani was a leader in that uh, parent revolt uh, around Thomas Jefferson High School. And she, she and others there uh, formed a coalition to fight against uh, these actions by the school board. And uh, eventually they took Thomas Jefferson to, uh, they took uh, the school and the uh, board to court uh, and uh, sued based upon, uh, you know, violations of uh, various constitutional uh, rights, uh, such as equal protection of the law under the 14th Amendment. And so uh, that 
case is continuing to proceed. But um, you know what it, what it shows though right now is the lengths to which the left is willing to go to uh, get their racial utopia, whatever that is in their mind. And what's interesting is that the people who are the victims of this are not just white children, but as in the case of Thomas Jefferson, they're Asian children, they're non-white uh, kids. But if they happen to stand in the way of this left-wing ideological uh, narrative, then the left is just fine with making them victims. And so uh, I think that, uh, you know, what's happening now in um, Thomas, at Thomas Jefferson uh, and uh, what Azar Nomani is doing is uh, not just uh, uh, pushing that lawsuit, continuing to help with that lawsuit, but also too, uh, the school has had decided that they weren't going to notify kids of their um, award of national merit uh, recognition, uh, which is uh, in a huge um, award that uh, is often used by students in order to get into better uh, universities and colleges. And you know they, the reason why the school did this is because they didn't want to make the kids who didn't receive a national merit award uh, feel worse because they didn't receive one. And the basis for that is again, harkening back to what I said earlier, uh, is, uh, is equity. All kids need to have the same outcomes not that they have the same opportunity to achieve awards and those sorts of things, but everybody has to be viewed as being the same. And so therefore um, the, the school, you know, ref did not uh, inform the uh, uh, parents and the kids of these awards in a timely manner so they could uh, use these uh, awards in the college uh, admissions process. Well, Azra and other parents there, you know, have complained to uh, the new uh, state officials in, uh, in Virginia, and Attorney General Jason Miaris has opened uh, an investigation of what has gone on at Thomas Jefferson. And I think we're going to be hearing more about that case and also Azra Nomani in the days uh, to come. So on the policy front, California certainly has been the epicenter of a very heated political battle to enact a controversial ethnic studies curriculum in our schools. Now, you profile in your book two very strong women who formed a grassroots organization to try and stop some of the most really um, radical aspects of this curriculum, which they believe would perpetuate anti-Semitism in our schools. So tell us their story and also where things stand with this battle over California's ethnic studies curriculum. Yeah, thanks, Tim. I mean, it, it's a it's a huge issue here in California and will be an issue across the country. Uh, the two women that you mentioned are Elena uh, Kaplan and uh, Leah Renson, who have uh, started an organization called the Alliance for Con uh, Constructive uh, Ethnic Studies, or, or ACES. Uh, and so what this uh, organization is doing is that it's fighting against what's called liberated ethnic studies. Liberated ethnic studies is big. I mean, when we think about ethnic studies, we think about, uh, you know, uh, looking at people and, and, and their ethnic cultures and, uh, you know, ensuring that everybody gets along, that, uh, you know, everybody can benefit by knowing something about other people's cultures. But this is not what liberated ethnic studies is about. A liberated ethnic studies is just another name really for uh, critical race theory and where you uh, base people uh, based upon their ethnicities, their racial uh, categories in oppressor classes versus oppressed classes. And uh, again, you have that whole dichotomy being used then to battle things like capitalism, which is viewed as being a uh, product of uh, white privilege, for example. Well, in the case of or liberated ethnic studies, that, that ideology had advanced so far that it actually permeated the first draft of an ethnic, mo uh, a model ethnic studies curriculum that was proposed in California. And so the, there was uh, not only uh, this. Uh, uh, Marxist uh, ideology that was in, uh, involved in that uh, draft curriculum, but also too, what you had were anti-Semitic and anti-Israel uh, tropes and doctrines uh, that were shoehorned in there as well. Um, Leah Ranson is a, a granddaughter of Holocaust survivors. 
And Elena Kaplan came uh, as an immigrant from the former Soviet Union. So they understand, you know, totalitarianism, they understand anti-Semitism, and they uh, saw, for example, when liberated ethnic studies draft curriculum, model curriculum, that uh, we had sections where the establishment of Israel was viewed as uh, using the term NABCA or a catastrophe, and uh, where we had provisions that pushed the boycott and divestment movement against Israel. And so you had uh, Elena and, um, uh, and Leah, you know, seeing these anti-Israel, anti-Semitic uh, parts of this um, curriculum and fighting against it, uh, organizing their organization with other organizations and with grassroots to uh, really raise up an outcry against this draft model curriculum. And, you know, to, to the extent that it was actually pulled back. Even in California, uh, there is a limit. And so they, uh, this was at, pulled back by California education officials. And, uh, you know, and eventually a more moderate version was, uh, was then approved. And so that's a victory, I think, for uh, even here in California, where you see, um, you know, the grassroots people, parents like Elena and Leah, who have put themselves forward even though you know you had people like Leah who said that she was never political, and it was only when she saw what was going on in the schools that she decided that something needed to be done, and that she was the person that needed to step up and do it, just like Gabs Clark. And so I think that you you're going to see going forward, you know, more people like this who are you know offended by the kind of uh, just extreme uh, curricula that is being pushed in the schools. And you're going to have more Leas, more Elenas who are going to step forward to battle these doctrines in the schools. Lance, one of the key themes that runs throughout your book is that of transparency or, or lack of it when we're talking about curriculum. Most of this controversial curriculum is rubber stamped by bureaucrats or enacted behind closed doors or at sparsely attended meetings. So what are some of the things that that parents can do to increase transparency in these decisions that are are being made and and make more parents aware of what's going on in their children's classroom? I think that's a really good question, Ro. I mean, if you look at, uh, you know, the activities of these school boards, uh, these school districts, uh, these state governments, you know, much of uh, the, well, the reason why critical race theory has been able to seep into uh, the classroom is because, you know, it's been, be- uh, these decisions have been taken behind closed doors with very little light and transparency so that the public can get a true understanding of what's going on and how that's going to affect uh, their children. And one of the tools that uh, a number of the parents who we profile in the book have used in order to shed that light is the Public Records Act uh, request. We profile a mom uh, from Rhode Island named Nicole Solis. And Nicole uh, wanted to know what was going on in her daughter's elementary school and started to ask her principal about uh, you know, the types of lessons that were uh, going on in her uh, daughter's classroom and whether they had anything to do with critical race theory. Well, the principal uh, clammed up and said that, well, she should file a Public Records Act request. Well, you know, uh, she took him at his word. And because she had a background as a lawyer, she what she did was she filed uh, not only one Public Records Act request, she filed 160. And so she you know, wanted to know what was being taught, what were the materials being used, uh, you know, what were the teaching methods that were uh, uh, being used with her kids and with all the other kids at her schools uh, in that uh, in that district. And so uh, the school board, you know, even despite the fact that they were the, or at least their school officials had been the ones to recommend the Public Records Act request route, you know, it threatened to sue Nicole <laughs> because she had made so many requests. Well, Nicole uh, fought back. She said that she would, uh, you know, defend against any suit and, uh, you know, said that she had right on her side because she has uh, the right as a citizen to be able to file these Public Records Act requests to, um, you know, get that information that is public information. The school district eventually backed down. But it just goes to show, and Nicole says, the uh, the lengths to which uh, these school districts and school boards are willing to uh, attack a person when they feel they are being threatened. But, uh, you know, what we're seeing is uh, not 
just people like Nicole, but like when I mentioned Azra Nomani, one of the things Azra did was uh, she wanted to find out how many school districts uh, in her area had been uh, using diversity, equity, and inclusion, DEI consultants. And what were their contracts like? How much were they being paid? How much tax dollars were being funneled into uh, uh, these contracts? And so she filed 200 different uh, Public Records Act requests to uh, find out about these contracts to see, you know, what their terms were, how much money was being used. And, you know, she found out that there were there was actually a large amount of money that was being funneled into these contracts and that uh, it was all fu uh, funding what she uh, terms the woke industrial complex. And so I think that when you look at uh, what uh, uh, Azra did, what um, Nicole did, you know, parents around the country, there's a parent here in uh, California, Kelly Shankoski, that we also profile, uh, who uh, 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 went and used uh, Public Records Act requests in her area in Monterey to find out about critical race theory uh, teachings there. And I think that what you see is across the country, people using Public Records Act requests in order to find out what is going on in their schools to shed that transparency, shed that light uh, on what should be uh, very revealing and uh, very informative for parents in order to make the decisions about whether they wanna keep their kids in those schools or not. So Lance, there are other parents uh, across California and certainly across the country that are struggling to confront woke indoctrination, just like the parents you profile in the Great Parent Revolt. So what are some of the things that the other Gabs, Clarks, and Azra and Omanis of the world can do in their communities to stop the spread of classroom ideology? Well, I think one of the big things, Tim, that uh, parents can do uh, is, uh, is organize. I mean, these shouldn't just be uh, the acts of individual superhuman parents. Uh, I think, and that's what you're finding actually across the country. Uh, the people that we profile in the book are not just individuals, but oftentimes they're part of uh, organizations of parents who have started uh, uh, groups uh, in order to give strength and voice to parents who up to this point have been voiceless and powerless. And so uh, we uh, profile, uh, for example, Tiffany Justice, who started Moms for Liberty, which now has um, uh, more than uh, 200, I think up to around 200 different chapters around uh, the country and around 85,000 members. Uh, we profile uh, people who've started organizations such as No Left Turn in Education, as Nomani was involved with Parents Defending Education. These and Lots of other groups around the country have sprung up in the last several years, uh, you know, a lot of it in order to combat critical race theory and other social uh, justice doctrines that are seeping into the classroom because uh, parents have seen, especially during the school closures and the uh, resultant um, distance learning that went on so that parents could see what's going on in their uh, kids' education on their computer screens, that they understand that what's going on is not academic learning in many cases, it's actually political indoctrination. And so I think one of the great uh, and positive outcomes of, you know, you hate to say it, of the uh, school closures and, and the COVID lockdowns was the fact that parents have a better understanding of what's going on. They've now organized, they're now uh, showing their strength uh, by demanding change in their uh, schools, and oftentimes they're receiving it. So Lance, other than the fight for Congress, the 2022 election can probably be best described as being, quote, a, a parent revolution, when these first-time parent candidates in California and across the country who were just fed up with the direction of our schools ran for and were actually elected to their, their local school boards. So, so bring us up to date on where things stand after the election. And are you feeling more or less optimistic that this grassroots movement to, to stop critical race theory in our schools will succeed? Well, first of all, I think, uh, Ro, that, uh, you know, it was a huge uh, day uh, for parents on Election Day in November, because all across the country, you saw school boards that had previously been controlled by uh, education special interest groups uh, now flip 
to uh, pro-parent slates of candidates in um, many places across the country, not just in red states like Florida, but also in places like uh, California. You saw parents uh, you know, gaining majorities on school boards uh, in order to change the direction of education in their schools and their school districts. And so I think that uh, you know, it's, it's a great uh, po- um, uh, opening round for parents that they've got now this opportunity to actually effect change for their kids. I think that what's important for parents now though, is that now that uh, they've elected a lot of their supporters uh, and their representatives onto these school boards is to be able to have a real game plan about what they're going to do now that they have, let's say a majority in uh, on a school board. And you know, one of the things that the Pacific Research Institute has done is to uh, give uh, parents, uh, these pro-parent uh, school board members, that type of game plan. We, for example, just recently, we organized a school board training uh, program or conference uh, down in San Diego, where we invited uh, pro-parent, pro-reform school board members uh, to uh, receive training from our expert trainers on how to be an effective school board members, how to confront issues like critical race theory, and how to improve student performance in the classroom as a school board member. And uh, we had a huge uh, outpouring of uh, interest. We had a, a great crowd at that conference in San Diego. And you know, and you wouldn't think that in a place like California that would happen, but it did. And so I think that that shows that uh, there is this groundswell of support for these types of changes, these types of candidates, these types of board members. And uh, you know, I, I think one of the great things we saw in the aftermath of our training session was that uh, uh, some of the boards have started to implement uh, some of the advice that we put out there. And for example, the representatives from the Temecula School Board have now um, passed a resolution banning CRT in uh, their school classroom. So I think that uh, we're seeing uh, a, a great initial success from uh, the, the groundswell of this great parent revolt. I think the important thing now is to keep that momentum going, make sure it doesn't die on the vine. But I think that because of the insidiousness of doctrines like critical race theory and how they have uh, been able to permeate so many schools around the country, I think this great parent revolt is going to continue. That It's only going to get bigger. And I think that in the end, that parents are going to win. Thanks so much, Lance. And for families, parents, and listeners out there who want to buy Lance's book, it's available on Amazon.com and all of the usual online places. Thanks so much, Lance. Thanks very much, Ro. Thanks, Tim. If you like this episode, please tell your friends and subscribe to PRI's podcast at iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, TuneIn, iHeartRadio, and Spotify. And when you're on these platforms, don't forget to give us a big five stars. If you don't subscribe to any of these, you can still listen on PRI's YouTube page, youtube.com slash Pacific Research One. That's the number one. Thanks for listening. I'm Rowena Ichon. Hope you'll come back again for next round with PRI.